You know, being back here in Perth at the Perth Concert Hall reminds me that it was just six years ago, not that far from here, that I met a man for coffee that would change my life. I met this man, David Goldstone, who founded what would become Western Australia's largest Rotary Club. And when I met with David, he sat me down for coffee and explained to me the story about his best friend, John. And he told me that John, in the 1950s, when this disease, polio, a deadly disease that ravages and maims individuals, cripples them, paralyzes them, and in some cases kills them, one of his best friend, John, came down with this disease, was paralyzed from the waist down. Slowly but surely, John recovered the use of his legs. Never quite fully, when he had kids and, and later grandchildren, he was never able to pick them up, never able to pick them up and carry them away like the other parents. But he recovered and he committed himself to the eradication of polio. And at the end of this coffee, David reached out. I'll never forget the way he grabbed my arm. And he said, Michael, it wasn't John that collapsed of polio all those years ago. It was me. And I don't want anyone's grief or pity. I just want to get on and eradicate this disease once and for all. And a few months after that, don't ask me how, it's, it's a long story in itself, but I found myself face to face with Australia's first female prime minister, and in my view, um, may not be politically correct to say this, but in my view, one of our greatest prime ministers, Julia Gillard. And I shared with her David's story, and I asked whether she would consider putting polio eradication on the agenda of the 2011 Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting that was set to be hosted right here in Perth. And she replied by saying she was interested, but she needed some help. You see, we often think our politicians can snap their fingers and change the world, but the truth is we can't blame the politicians because we have to give them permission to spend what is in the end our money, including to issues like polio eradication. So our solution, again, another long story, was to put on a concert on the margins of this summit. We'd bring together all these people and show public support. There was only one very practical problem. Besides the fact I'd never organized a concert before, the best I had done is a sausage sizzle, and I think about 50 people rocked up and promptly walked away again. <laughs> but if the question was, is how are we going to get people there? I was worried about selling tickets, because to be honest, I was worried no one would buy them, and if the idea was to show public support, then not having anyone come up was counterproductive. But then, of course, if we just allowed anyone to come, our insurers wouldn't like that as well. Suddenly, thousands upon thousands of people rocked up. So we put the question out there, and it was actually an American guy who had become one of our co-founders of a later initiative, Ryan Gould, who said, maybe you can raise awareness and distribute tickets. And so the solution was a very um, cheaply produced, hastily put together website where you could log on, sign a petition, and in signing a petition, you went in the draw to earn a ticket. 25,000 people um, signed up, and 5,000 people earned a ticket. And we delivered this petition to the Prime Minister, and the day after our concert, she announced $50 million to the eradication of polio, with other leaders, a combined total of $118 million in support of Rotary and other work around the world. And buoyed by this, we decided to turbocharge this model. Less than a year later, I stood on the great lawn of New York's historic Central Park, a city I now call home, where we produced an event with 60,000 global citizens taking action. In the last five years, we've produced five of these concerts with some of the music industry's biggest name, from Jay-Z to Beyonce to Metallica to Chris 
coming out of retirement, in terms of Coldplay, Rihanna, you know, the list goes on, and hosts like Hugh Jackman and others as well. And all of this movement, people taking action, has led to 8 million global citizens signing up to take 7.7 million actions that's helped mobilize more than $27 billion in terms of commitment that is set to affect the lives of 737 million people by 2030. Thank you, thank you. But you know what? Throughout this, we've learned a number of lessons and principles. You see, the goal of a campaign when people are cynical, they say, does online advocacy work? And I say, yes. If you follow a few principles, you can do extraordinary things. Firstly, it's having a very clear goal. It's knowing what you want to achieve. In the case of polio, it's not enough to say, I want a world free of polio, no. It's saying that there is currently a funding gap of more than $1.5 billion that we need to mobilize and pledge. It's saying that we need to go out to governments and get this funding. But it doesn't always have to be financial. We've teamed up in Tanzania with a 19-year-old youth, Aristarek, who's campaigning, calling for the Tanzanian parliament to amend the 1971 Law of Marriage Act so that he can prevent girls as young as 14 being married off before they reach adulthood. And he's calling for the age of marriage to be raised to 18 for boys and girls. But knowing your goal isn't enough. What we found is that you need to know who can change this, who has the power to make these decisions, who can bring about this change, who can you target. In the case of polio, the guy on the left, many of you will know, he's the world's most wealthiest man, Bill Gates, and together with Rotary International, he's contributed billions of dollars towards this effort. But that's not enough, we need more. And so the guy on the right is Canada's Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, and we're currently running a campaign to get him to contribute $150 million towards this effort. But sometimes the people who have the power to make the decisions, they may not be world famous. They may not be world leaders, they may not be billionaires. In India, our partners there, they're working, lobbying the Ministry of Railways, asking them for all the 14,000 trains in India, carry millions of people, it's the largest private employer in India, asking them to provide toilets that don't actually drop human waste onto the tracks, causing disease and indeed death to spread. But even if you know your goal and you know who has the power to make decisions, one of the basic principles that is most often overlooked is why? Why should these leaders care? Why should they bother to do anything? And sometimes it can be so simple. I remember when we found out that Julia Gillard, the day before, that she was going to make this big announcement to polio. I was walking with her advisor, and they were explaining and talking me through this, and I said, why is she doing this? Why has she given us all this funding? And he just turned around and said, it's the stories. It's the stories of the health workers, of the Rotarians. It's the stories of polio survivors like David. That's inspired her. Timely reminder that sometimes it's people, indeed, people's stories that change other people. But sometimes it doesn't have to be as sentimental. This man, the Prime Minister of Sweden, we asked him whether he would consider pledging 60 million toilets around the world to provide sanitation. We asked him, this man who had declared that he would lead the world's first feminist government, we said, how can you call yourself a feminist when you won't work towards providing sanitation for girls so that when they hit their puberty, that they don't need to drop out because of something as basic as not having a toilet in their school? He stepped up to the challenge. But these principles, I know what you're thinking, you're like, well, what's this got to do with social media? And that's the point, nothing. The principles that drive these campaigns are the same principles that worked just as well hundreds of years ago. You know, this man, William Wilberforce, led what was called one of the world's first social movements. 
He built together an army of activists in the, in the British Isles, and he presented a petition to Parliament that when he presented it, rolled from one end of Parliament to the other and led to the abolition of the slave trade. But what social media can do is it can reach people like never before. It can mobilize and generate responses so that 14,000 tweets to a minister in Sweden can literally, as she's on the tarmac, force her to give us a call via her embassy saying, I can't respond, I'm getting that many tweets, what do I need to do? And then we said, well, you need to tweet and then you need to meet with us quick so we can tell you what you need to do. Or this man here, after receiving 235,000 emails, tweets, letters, I received an email from him. He's the Prime Minister of Malta, Joseph Muscat, saying, I've got in all your emails, tweets, letters, and so on. What about a phone call? So I hopped on the phone with him, and I remember he said, what do you actually want me to do? I asked him whether he was hosting last year's Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting as a follow-up to Perth, and I said, would you bring leaders together and announce new support for polio? He did, and in fact, he brought together Malcolm Turnbull, and this year alone, Malcolm Turnbull's government has provided $30 million to polio eradication efforts. But you know what? Sometimes even social media isn't enough. This year, we've been trying to get in touch with the President of France. We've called, we've emailed, we've provided letters. Nothing has literally worked. So we decided to team up with one of the world's biggest names, complete with her 65 million followers, to send President Hollande a message. <laughs> As you can imagine, we got a response. In fact, 24 hours later, I... <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I received this letter signed by the President of France 24 hours later. But you know what? When we actually looked into the writing, when we actually boiled down to it, amongst all the niceties, there was no commitment. No new funding, and that's the point. My final lesson is this. Campaigning is hard work. Very few campaigns will be won overnight. William Wilberforce, it was in 1789 when he stood before the Parliament of Great Britain. He spoke for three hours about the abolition of the slave trade. And he said, having heard all this, you may choose to look the other way, but you can never again say you did not know. Well, the parliament voted his bill down. Indeed, it was almost another 50 years before in 1833, just three days before Wilberforce died on his deathbed, that he heard the words he had fought his whole life to hear. The end of slavery was past. But sometimes, it's not even in our lifetimes that we see these end results. You know, sometimes you can do everything, and yet the gangs that you want will outlive you. I remember last year, on the subway in New York, almost breaking down and crying when I found out that this commitment, which we had put so much energy and effort into, I received an email saying that the government had decided one year later to renege its promise. And just like that, stroke of a pen, millions of dollars wiped off. And so for us, what do we do? Well, we dedicate ourselves to building a community of like-minded individuals. I came across these words of a former unionist who said, every powerful politician, every brilliant intellectual, every visionary founder of an organization has an expiration date and too many leaders leave us having failed to sustain something larger than themselves. When we build a tool that can outlast its creator, that's when our work really matters in the long run. To think long means not just asking the question, what can I win today? But asking the question, what can I build forever? Truth is, not all of us will be around to see the ultimate end result, something that I learned when in July this year I was in Stockholm. And I, that day I, I spent three hours with Rihanna, 
and what should have been a memorable day, a pinnacle of my career, briefing this world-famous celebrity about our work, became memorable for different reasons. You see, polio eradication, we've made str great strides in the last six years. You know, this year, just 27 cases compared to over 1,000 just six years ago. But for some, that's not long enough. I received the news that same day that my good friend David, a man that had become the grandfather I never knew, a man that when I won Young Western Australian of the Year, and because I was off gallivanting around the world, he went and received it for me. He had lost his battle with a terminal illness and, and post-polio syndrome and passed away. And the first thought that came to me is, what a shame that a man who desired more than anything to see a world without polio will not be able to see that now. And I spoke in, in London when I got off the plane to his daughter, Michelle, and his wife, Hannah. And they reassured me, and they said, no, David, David was the optimist. He knew that the eradication of polio wasn't a question of if, but a question of when. Why? Because he knew that there were now, thanks to his efforts and others, there were now a whole generation of people that he had passed the bat into that would take this forward and that would eradicate polio. He died content in that knowledge. In a very real sense, he had helped build something larger than himself. And now at Global Citizen, we have a movement of eight million people around the world that have reached just this year alone commitments of almost 200 million people to be affected and their lives improved. We're going to be taking Global Citizen Festival to India on November 19, and we're bringing Coldplay, and um, it's going to be on World Toilet Day. And in the words of Chris Martin, that makes a lot of sense for those of you that associate Coldplay with toilets. Um, <laughs> but for me, you know, as we continue this journey, we look at what we achieve, and as we scale up this movement around the world, you know, I don't for one second believe that a tweet, email, phone call can by itself change the world. But what I do believe is that when those emails are well targeted, tweets go to the right people. Maybe together they can build just enough pressure to get a politician to give the funding to help health workers on the ground to eradicate polio, to enable laws to be changed so that girls can live and grow and achieve their full potential and not get married off before the age of 18. There's a saying that I picked up at the UN that goes, no one can do everything, but everyone can do something. Rihanna sent her tweet to President Hollande. Aristarach in Tanzania is lobbying his parliamentarians, petitioning them. And David, David did the most human thing of all. He shared his story. So my question to you is, what are each of you going to do now? Thank you.